Call the uh, Finance Committee meeting to order. All members are present and accounted for. Um, I would accept a motion to amend and approve the agenda. The amendment would be, is this the, to add SA 8-20? Is that the only one, Jody? Okay. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Um, we have minutes from the last meeting. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'll move approval of the minutes from the July 17th meeting. Second. All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. The ayes have it. All right. First on the agenda is a presentation from Dan Nees about the financing authority and also discussion of the RFQ. Um, so, Dan, please come forward and regale us. Well, at least I have pants on. <laughs> um, mostly I'm happy to, I'll just give you a quick update of where we are and then we can, I'll answer questions. Um, What happened to it? Get a sense of um, <clears throat> what the, uh, the, the purpose of the RFQ is. And then the other thing is establishing the financing authority for resiliency and get a sense of where we are on that. So I don't know sure. if that's a, enough prelude, but that's what sure. I was interested in. Uh, so the, uh, the RFQ ha was released, I guess, two weeks ago, two and a half weeks ago, something like that. Um, actually, today there will be a pre-proposal meeting here in the chambers for any potential applicants that have questions. Um, and I believe, and I'm sorry, I don't have it in front of me, but the, the application deadline is the first part of November. Right. Um, I think it's November 2nd. Yeah, so um, it has been submitted to about probably 80 different firms. I've been sending it. Eight zero? Eight zero. Wonderful. Right. I've sent it to many financing firms and institutions, so it's getting, it'll get a pretty wide um, distribution. Um, I've gotten a handful of inquiries, um, and just, just to indicate how um, important I take ethics, I had several firms ask if I would be a partner in their proposal. <laughs> I told them I wrote the RFQ, and so that probably was not a good idea. Right. Um, well, it might not be a bad idea, but <laughs> probably not ethical. So, what, but one of the things that's encouraging is that we're seeing a lot of finance, uh, interest from finance firms. So we're hoping you know, that will um, translate to the final proposals that are in. Just, but to be clear, I would be extremely satisfied if a single highly um, qualified consortium of applicants came in together and we had one proposal and I'd be happy with that because that we're doing something innovative and what we're looking for is effectiveness um, so so can I can I stop you there because sure. um, uh, I've also been getting inquiries from various constituencies around the city so if you look at the RFQ um, there's uh, a weighting scale on page five and 50% of it is financial mm -hmm. Um, which obviously if uh, the point is to establish a financial entity uh, that's that's appropriate waiting I would think but uh, resiliency is more than financing so you use the word consortium I'd like to see consortia uh, some of the concerns I've heard is that there'll be big national firms that will come in with this sort of omnibus set of skills and so forth. Um, when we did the uh, uh, efficiency for the city, 
uh, we had a couple of small firms and then we had Honeywell. We went with Honeywell, a big national firm that sort of spins us off. We got the second or third team and we didn't get a good product. So I guess one of the concerns is when we select people is what else are we looking for in the consortium besides financial capability? Uh, I think it's a very fair question, and this is not the first time we've had this conversation with various people across the city. And, and so there's several, um, or at least, and I don't, obviously, Ross, I'm not telling you what, what you're thinking, but what I've heard from other people, there's several parts to that question. The first is, are we, are we um, giving preference to large national, international firms over local talent? No. Mm-hmm. Okay. No. Um, but I think the, and, and as a matter of fact, um, there are some positives to working with really large firms. So, um, for example, if you're building a football stadium, it's probably a good thing to have a firm that has the capacity and the resources and the equipment to build that stadium. And having, you know, 50 small firms instead of one big one is probably not efficient. So there's reasons why you know, scale matters, and, and we, we're going to have to look at that. But what matters more, the, the reason why we did an RFQ instead of an RFP, it comes down to that. If you do an RFP, it's because you've already answered the question of what you want. Mm-hmm. And so you're just trying to find those firms that can help you get what you want in the most efficient and effective way possible. We went the path of an RFQ because, with all due respect, we don't know what we want. We know we want to redo helming. <coughs> And by the way, Hillman is background noise, right? Pardon? Hillman is background noise. It doesn't mean it's not important. It's, it's right. vitally important, and it needs to get right. done now. And I've been hearing some rumors about how we can wait on Hillman. Okay, I don't think so. Um, <laughs> but it's got to get done at some point. And so, but that, how you build and finance Hillman, there's some really innovative, cool things you can do, but that's background noise. What matters and what's difficult here is City Dock. And, and I didn't say we don't know what we want in City Dock. I, we have plans, and the community has spoken and very effectively. But it's how we make our community more resilient. We don't know what that really means. So what we're looking for in an RFQ is not just the capacity to finance, which is essential, the capacity to design and build, which is essential, the capacity to operate and maintain, which is essential. We're looking for creativity. We're looking for a partner into the future who's going to help us implement a broad innovative vision for our community we don't know what that looks like yet that could be a very small um, firm in Annapolis that's the linchpin of that thinking and that partnership with the city and bringing the larger firms along so that's the point of the RFQ we are not we are in no position to be excluding anybody that can help us achieve that vision and if it's Honeywell it's Honeywell if it's AECOM and I don't know what it is about AECOM but you talk about getting people's backs up mention AECOM and everybody's got a pretty visceral reaction heard it too I'm not an, an engineer so whatever um, but or it could be firms from here in Maryland or more specifically firms from here in Annapolis all of those are open what matters is do we get to where we want to be so that was a longer answer than you're looking for Bottom line is we are we have nope. no pre- preconceived notion about what these firms look like. It's not a longer answer, but you did say a couple of trigger words in your discourse. To me, we had it drummed into our head during the weather together that resiliency is much bigger than city dock. It's much bigger than sea level rise. Resiliency is our ability to recuperate from an earthquake, a tornado, a a tsunami, a a, a derecho, all of those things. So are we thinking in this RFQ resiliency with a capital R or a small r where we're more focused? And you're right, Hillman gets to be a distraction. Uh, Nuisance flooding gets to be a distraction seawalls even get to be a distraction, although that's a bigger part of resiliency in my mind. It's still not the totality of resiliency. So what are we looking for? I mean, I I understand the RFQ is we need to refine what we're looking for, and I applaud that. I think that's very smart. But are we thinking here in terms of capital R resiliency? Or are so, we thinking in terms of smaller scope? Well, I think it, it, this is where we have to combine the conversations of the RFQ and the finance authority. So um, we, 
made the decision to advance the RFQ as a mechanism for better defining what the authority should look like. And the idea was if we were to, when we put a project out there, we can identify where the gaps in the city systems are, how a new system of financing um, institution of some type, and when we say authority, we don't know really what it is yet until it's designed, but what that would need to look like, and we learned that from actually putting these programs and these projects in place. Um, so the, the RFQ itself, by law and by definition, is targeted to the two infrastructure projects, Hillman and um, City Dock. But once that is in place, then we start dealing with broader resilience issues. And but I can't City remember Dock, which R is which, little or big, but the Hillman and City Dock are the target of the RFQ. City Dock, though, is a confounding word, at least for me. And um, if I'm just having this dialogue alone and it's not beneficial for the committee, I'll go offline and stop. But City Dock right now means City Dock Public Spaces, the ULIHA effort. City Dock may include some addressing of nuisance flooding and hopefully is including what city dock would look like in addressing sea level but to me city dock is a bigger umbrella than just the ulia correct okay correct yeah. and so but the U, the rfq is referring to just the control the city has over that particular place so it's what the city is going to do from an infrastructure perspective so a city city truly city dock at that point but the bigger question then is what does resilience really mean and i think i've been on the record here several times as saying resilience is a broad it's what it takes for this community to be um, economically environmentally and socially vibrant into the future um, what is not what we have not talked to you about is in addition to looking at the city dock and hillman project we were also working with um, hacka on an idea of moving um, the housing projects, subsidized housing projects, to microgrids. And the idea was threefold. One was to help get more renewable energy into the city and potentially, if done right, re reduce the energy costs and needs of those particular communities, the ones that need it the most. It would also, number two, make them more reliant, right? So when the big storm came in, we saw a great amount of irony and that the communities that have the most reliable power in a big hurricane would be the ones that were always the first ones to go down and the last ones to come back up. They would be the ones that are still online and the rest of us would drive by and envy when we saw right. their lights on. Um, but more importantly, it created an opportunity for economic development and social gain within those communities that were part that, that needed it the most. It was not a climate change or a resilience issue as defined by city dock and sea level rise. So we chose to, so that's happening at the same time. It was just an indication of where we see the city needs to go. What we know to be true is in order for the city to be truly, by the way, it's not, I am certainly worried about climate change and that's what I focus much of my career on right now. But you listed off a bunch of different shocks that could hit the city that we're gonna figure out how we're gonna deal with. There are, it is more likely there are gonna be social and economic shocks going through this city that we're going to have to address. Those I'm really concerned about, and those we have to start moving forward with now at the same time. So that's what resilience truly means. And but so if we don't have those things figured out, if, even if we put seawalls up, we're going to be in trouble. You know what I'm going to say next. No, I don't, but I'm looking forward to it. is bigger than City Dock. Absolutely. In fact, resiliency is Ward 8, parts of Ward Absolutely. 2, parts of other wards. So again, I keep looking for Resiliency with a capital R or resiliency with a much narrower, smaller focus, geographic focus? Because to me, resiliency in Eastport is very critical to my constituency and any other low-lying area in the city. And I think we have a very ready partner in the county because they have a whole heck of a lot of more low-lying areas than we do in the city. But sure. I'm worrying about the city and worrying about the financing authority and what it's going to be looking for under the resiliency umbrella, I really get uncomfortable when I keep hearing city dock, city dock, when I think resiliency is a much bigger issue. And again, are we financing, are we focusing on a financing authority that is city dock specific or is resiliency specific? 
We are focusing on a finance authority that is citywide. Good. And there's resilience wide. Right. Thank you. Right. So what this institution would have the capacity to finance is entirely up to you and how you want to capitalize it and what kind of authorities you want to give it and what type of infrastructure you would like to move into that particular financing mechanism. Now, I, you are, you're going to be preaching to the choir if you talk to me about needing to expand resilience. I agree with you completely. I would suggest that some of what, first of all, Hillman is, a, is, is what it is, right? So it, it, regardless of the debates we have about making sure each of the wards are addressed and taken care of, Hillman is the 800-pound gorilla in the room when it comes to the city's infrastructure that it has to get dealt with. When it comes to city dock, quite honestly, that was a, a, a reaction to opportunity. And it was the ULI process that was going on. We said, okay, if you're going to go down this path, then let's go ahead and do it, and let's see what we can do as it relates to Hillman. I, would, I agree completely. Um, and just, you know, it, we had a lot of internal discussion. When I say internal, myself and my partners on this project about how we approach this. The focus of our institution, as a matter of fact, is to address resilience for the most disenfranchised communities. That's what we do. And we, when we refer to disenfranchised communities, we're referring to economically. That's our primary focus. And so we get that, and we understand the need for the city to move in that direction. We just had to go where the momentum was taking us, and that was Hillman and then City Dock. Um, so, but I don't blame anybody for saying, wait a minute, let's think more clearly. What I would suggest, and this is actually something that um, Teresa and I were talking about before we came in, the next step is for this city to truly define what it means by resilient and what it means, what are the true risks that it sees that it's trying to address. And so we can talk about the other wards and the other, the need of the rest of the community, but the city's got to say, here's what matters to us and here's where we see the threats coming from and here's the type of infrastructure we need in order to address those risks. Now we can talk about it. And that's, we can lead you through that conversation, but that's ultimately um, a conversation that has to happen with city council, with the mayor, and the agency staff. But this is the finance committee. And uh, from a financial perspective, I'm hearing uh, about three different pots of money, potentially, with different orders of magnitude. So Hillman Garage being done, where however it gets done, is a you know, 15 to $25 million project. City Dock as presented to us in the preliminary form is a $50 million project potentially, and I don't know what it's including and not including, but resiliency, when you and I talked, and particularly when we talked about it in relationship to what the Academy is facing with their levy, which I was not surprised, but still uh, uncomfortable when you said that the cost estimates they're talking about in with a B, not an M, uh, I think our resiliency uh, effort has an order of magnitude much bigger than 50 or 25, and you threw out some numbers that were just illustrative, but am I or am I not correct that we're really thinking about something that m was, is going to have to be, over time, thinking about a much bigger pot of money? Certainly. I mean, just that there, I don't, I'm assuming you all saw the report that came out earlier this summer where they, they they did an estimate on what it would take to fortify the United States basically and coastal communities looking specifically at two types of seawalls and that was it. If you if you dig into that information the city of Annapolis is looking at about four and a half miles of fortification that would be necessary. I don't know where that is. I don't know how accurate that is and the, you, remember these are computers that are doing this so right. they've probably never been to Annapolis or maybe they have but right. um, and they talked about about a 50 million dollar cost for seawalls. Um, all of the issues that go into that, how it affects the character of the community, everything else, that, that's background noise. So I don't know. Well, let's just assume that number's relatively accurate. City Doc gives you an example of why that doesn't work well enough, right? So now we've got a quarter mile stretch. I think that's about the linear feet of the area of City Doc that we're looking at, something like that. Is now the estimates are, and I don't know how they depends came. upon what contour you follow. If you yeah, just go depends straight on how, to the academy exactly. to the bridge, right, or how much you had to drink out of the bar and how many miles <laughs> that adds to it. But um, I don't know about the cost. I don't. I don't. I'm not an engineer. But if it's let's say you're right, the number you heard, 50 million is correct. We just doubled the amount that we need in a one quarter mile section because of what we want as a community. 
So we should assume that what we're talking about to truly fortify and maintain the character of our community and everything else, we're talking in the hundreds of millions of dollars over right. time. Right. Now just do the math. You guys are responsible for the city's budget. That's why we're here today. Mm -hmm. Imagine how that's going to get done. So let's just go ahead and zero out everything else in the budget and let's add it to that. Um, that's Turn just, out the lights. Exactly. So that's <laughs> just looking at the waterfront. Yeah. And storm surge and sea level rise and those types of things. It's not getting at the truly important things in our community right. that are in other places where I live, where the vast majority of us live. And we're talking a, a significant investment. Over a long period of time and, and much sure. more global than a garage or a, a public space at City Dock. Yes. Right. Okay. Yes. All right. We're talking uh, a lot of infrastructure. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, I have a question. Yes. Um, Mr. Nees, you started off talking about uh, the RFQ and the idea of a consortium coming in. Yeah. Um, and the two pieces of that would be financial and resiliency. Is that correct? Primarily. Okay. Yeah. Um, with some, with some, the, the traditional stuff: design, build, mm -hmm, operate, maintain. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You also said that we, as a, as the policymakers in the city, have to decide what resiliency is. I think so. <laughs> Which um, we're going to need some guidance on doing that. I think so, and we're helping you with that now. I didn't mean to imply that's not happening. Okay. Um, but it it has a direct impact on how you set up these financing systems. Mm -hmm. So will the companies that you are looking to create this consortium also have the flexibility for the resiliency? I mean, can they bring in their creative ideas, designs? Um, you, you indicated that that's what the RFQ does. It allows them to answer the question that we haven't answered yet. Yes. So, well, so, I, and I hope this doesn't sound like a cop out, but I'll say, I hope so. Because okay. that's the reason for setting it up the way they would. And just so you guys know, there is a there's a an easy way out of this process, and that is if we're not getting what we want, we stop and we go ahead and issue an RFP for Hillman, and you get it done, and you figure out how you're going to pay for it. Mm -hmm. And that's you guys have to make some difficult finance decisions on that, but they're they're difficult politically, but not difficult conceptually, and mm -hmm. and you you do that. So there's really a low risk situation here. It is the city doc part that creates the real uncertainty here. So I hope so. Um, what we're looking for, the, the part of the beauty of an RFQ is you create conversation with the firms that you ultimately select. And even if when you get into the, the process of um, identifying finalists and things like that, you're, you're talking to them. And when you, so I, actually you said something that was fascinating when you said, will they be part of the resiliency? Is what I heard when you said that was, will they be part of helping us figure out what it means to be resilient and how we're going to get to get where mm -hmm. we need to be? And that is, th they have to, mm -hmm. right? We don't need to have a conversation about how to engineer City Doc to match what the ULI team came up with. Just do it. Mm -hmm. um, we, and that's going to be complicated, but, but we don't need a conversation about um, how to do helmet. There's some we could do some really cool adaptive reuse type things that we should probably talk about, but we know how to do that. Mm -hmm. What we really want to talk about is, well, if you look at resilience like this, this is what may be possible. This is what we might be able to do. Getting full circle in the conversation to the size of the firms, this is where you could make an argument having a handful of smaller firms that are engaged in a conversation from their own unique perspective gives you a more holistic outcome than just having one large firm who's responding specifically to particular things. So I'm not trying to foreshadow who we're going to select. I'm just mm -hmm. saying th this is a reason why we have not decided on we're going after large AECOM-like firms. We're going to be very open about how we do this. So again, as is my habit, a longer answer than you're looking for. But um, we're hoping that those by having the consortium, we get to that very uh, the answer to that question you just asked. And if we create, or if it comes to pass that there is a consortium, would there be a entity that would oversee all of them? Would that be? That would be, in my opinion, mm -hmm. which is the only one that matters at this table right now. 
Um, <laughs> that would be the financing authority, which would be an independent institution that works on behalf of the city of Annapolis. Mm -hmm. And it would be their job to coordinate all those activities. Um, I think that's the, you know, that's the most appropriate place. And again, that was part of the, the method for doing the RFQ to inform um, how we would design this new institution. That we would have that actual on the ground experience to point to. And I think that's exactly where mm -hmm. it should go. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Fred? So just um, a, a quick summary. I, along with uh, Alderman Savage, had the opportunity to have lunch with you and Joanna and that uh, Joanne and that set up uh, some initial set of questions and you and I had coffee I just think from a councilmatic perspective this is the number one job for us it's at the 40,000 foot level it's looking out 20 and more years and um, I do like this RFQ approach I hope it shucks out something but I also like your attitude that if it doesn't, then we just pick up and, and move on. So, yeah. I just uh, want to clear, uh, not clarify, but, um, remind you of what I promised you last time I was here. Um, we are currently outlining and drafting a business plan, for lack of a better definition. And that's really what this is. Um, and, you know, we often hesitate to release things like that because it's conceptual. You know, you're mm -hmm. even... You know, there's I my background is in business, and I've written a lot of and reviewed a lot of business plans. Not one of them did the business look like what the business plan said it was going to look like <laughs> when they wrote the business plan. So we're we're hesitant to say, here you go, this is how it's going to look. But we're doing this now, and we're we're kind of laying out what's possible and how it would look. And remember, the big part about this is not institutionally setting it up. Where's the money going to come from? So right. we we tap danced around that when we came up with the real big numbers. Sure. Um, but that's the real issue. Where's the money going to come from? And that's what, um, those are the difficult decisions you're going to have to make. It'll be easy for me to recommend it, which I will. Um, but you'll have that, you'll have a bit something to react to um, as we move forward with this. Well, I think this is exciting. Please let us know when you need us and uh, how we can help. And uh, be looking forward to hearing how the RFQ comes out. Thank you. Thank you for coming down. I appreciate it. Thank you. All right, next on the agenda is supplemental, pardon? Supplemental appropriations, yes. SA 7-20, um, more money from the um, tr youth triathlon. Yes, the uh, rec recreation and parks have a donation for their youth triathlon of $2,945, and they want to add this to their budget so they can spend it. Are there questions? Uh, Mr. Uh, Chair, I'll move approval of SA 720. Second. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 The ayes have it. Added to the agenda is SA 8 20, which is a um, state operating grant. Or <laughs> um, I take it we have uh, our fire chief and deputy fire chief here to talk to us about it. Welcome and congratulations again, gentlemen. I missed Thank the swearing you. in last week. Thanks. I'll let uh, Deputy Chief Spriggs talk about it. This is 100% uh, grant from MIMS which is Maryland Institute for Emergency Medical Services Systems for some ballistic vests for our firefighters. So good morning. So we implemented um, <clears throat> our program, unfortunately we had to, uh, for the safety of our personnel, uh, and we began issuing ballistic protection so that when they respond on incidents within the city or even within the county, they have some level of protection for themselves when they're treating patients. And um, it's unfortunate that's the day and age that we live in uh, but we were trying to be proactive in providing that level of protection. So we applied for this grant through MIMS, and we were awarded um, just under $10,000 to purchase four additional Level 3A vests and helmets. So the Level 3A vests, you may not be familiar with those, are similar to 
the vest that the police officers are wearing on the streets currently. The only addition to the vest that we have uh, is they include pockets so the um, EMS providers can carry tourniquets and extra bandages, uh, and they're red, so they're clearly marked as fire department personnel, uh, so they would not be mistaken um, as police officers. We currently have vests in the field issued to every provider that's working, every fire department provider that's working uh, on the street. These would be uh, in addition to those vests. How much, did, how much did red cost? <laughs> Nine thousand four hundred twenty. Totally yes. <laughs> Do we get this grant every year? This no. grant is not guaranteed every year, no, sir. Okay. This looks like a no-brainer to me, Mr. Well, Chair. Sheila had. Yeah, I did have a question. I I, I agree, though. It's a no-brainer. Um, are these vests going to be in vehicles so that they're easily accessible? Each morning, personnel are required to take a vest of the appropriate size with them in the vehicle so that when they respond, um, when they're alerted to the type of call, for instance, if it's a, sh a shooting or a stabbing or a domestic uh, or an unknown medical problem, uh, the providers are required to put them on prior to leaving the station so that when they arrive mm -hmm. uh, or when they even stage waiting for the police officers to arrive, um, they have them on. There have been instances in Anne Arundel County where they've had providers respond to a call of this type uh, and they've been sitting a block away or two blocks away and the suspect has actually gone by and they've had no level of protection at all we're not mm -hmm. going to have our providers put in that situation so we currently do not have funding to issue each firefighter their own vest so uh, to be fiscally responsible and to make the program work we have a certain uh, quadre of vests in each station that they pick they get it's just like their turnout gear they, uh, they're assigned it every morning and then they turn it back in and it's used by somebody else the next day. Well, uh, so what would it take for each of our firefighters to be protected? A substantial amount of money. Um, but then we also have to keep in mind that we have to replace these vests every seven years. Because it's not, it's not a buy one time and it'll last you the rest of your career. They do have a shelf life. Currently, the program we have, though, is working. Uh, it's worked very well, and uh, we'll continue to evaluate it to see if we need to move forward with asking for best for each individual person. But this was the way to get the program started. Uh, we are well ahead of some of our counterparts out there uh, with providing this protection to our, our firefighters and our medics. And this, this is totally different than the Rescue Task Force. You know, we've been here before with the Rescue Task Force, which are the larger vest with other additional EMS equipment and that's for when we send our firefighters and medics in under police protection. These vests here are for uh, the units for any violent situation that they come up on so that they have them individually. Okay, well I, I take comfort in knowing that you're monitoring it and will keep us abreast. Yeah. Thank you. What exactly do we get for our $9,500? Four vests. We'll get four vests and four, and four helmets. helmets. And All right. helmets. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'll move approval of SA 820. Is there a second? Second. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 The ayes have it. Thank okay. you. Thank you. I know. Well, but you need it, you need it. Um, yeah. Next item on the agenda, and I will turn to the city finance director, is the um, presentation of the, am I right, budget book? Yes. Um, are we ready for that, or you had indicated there might be a timing issue? Yeah, there's there's a timing issue. Uh, I've completed my review, and the city manager went through it over this last weekend and have, has some comments to go over with me today. So we're very close. Okay, great. But okay. it should be within days. So All right. We'll we, get that we're up curious to see what we did. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I can understand that. All right, thank you. So now we'll move on to... Uh, legislation before the committee. The first one is 025-19, uh, the Watershed Restoration Fund, and this is an amendment to the language in Title 17, uh, and we have a staff report that is uh, fairly uh, explanatory. Um, is there, are, the city manager, are you going to speak to this? Good morning. Good morning. So uh, this 
ordinance changes the purposes of the watershed restoration fund. The current purposes are land acquisition, study, engineer, design, purchase, construction, expansion, repair, maintenance, landscaping, and inspection of public stormwater management systems. So if we want to spend money on anything that is not a public stormwater management system, we cannot use these funds for that purpose. This came up in the FY 2020 budget. It came up in the FY 19 budget as well. Um, in FY 19, the council amended the budget to allow us to use this money for no discharge zone education outreach and trash skimmers, neither of which fall within the definition as relating to a public stormwater management system. We've also heard loud and clear from the environmental community that uh, the city doesn't do stream restoration projects like the county does or watershed restoration projects. So while our fund is called a watershed restoration fund, we can't use it to restore our waterways. <laughs> So we uh, researched other counties, other cities, tried to see within the state of Maryland to see what kind of language they had um, and found as we did that that we thought the county's language, which is very, very similar to this, was the broadest that would encompass both the existing purposes, so all of the existing purposes fall within the proposed language, as well as any uh, effort that supports our compliance with our NPDES, MS4, and TMDL requirements. So we are proposing to broaden the purposes of the Watershed Restoration Fund. It will allow us to do stream restoration projects, watershed restoration, and it will allow us to do educational outreach like no discharge zone, which pollutes our waters and we're trying to you know, reduce the pollutants in our water. Oh, please. Um, Ms. Sutherland, I guess it was not this year's budget, but last year's budget, we approved the skimmer, uh, $30,000, if I remember correctly. Um, and I think we were told then that we could not use it. Um, and so are there any provisions anywhere that will allow us to fulfill that decision that we made a year so, and a half ago? So trash skimmers would help us clean our waterways, which would mm -hmm. help us meet our permitting MS, MPDES and our TMDL requirements, MS4, all of that. Mm -hmm. So yes, it could be used for the trash skimmers. But we don't. We can't use this funding. Is there another? You, can, you could under this After, proposed purpose. Okay. Under the existing purposes, you, can. you cannot. So you funded 30000 from the watershed. I, I think it was thirty. I agree. Yeah. I don't remember the exact number, but I think it was thirty for trash skimmers, and we didn't buy trash skimmers. Okay. So under this new legislation, if it passes, we mm -hmm. will be able to use that. Yes. Um, in Baltimore has those trash skimmers, but they have a lot of them. Um, we only funded one, um, and I guess this isn't a question, but I guess it is that somebody needs to kind of evaluate whether it's beneficial. Yes, ma'am. But did we even, it's the one we funded was passive, right? Did we even deploy that? No, mm -hmm. because you funded it out of the Watershed Restoration right. Fund, and as we put on the record when you pass that amendment, it is not an allowable mm -hmm. use right. of those funds. Okay. I'm not sure, Mr. Chair, where, where do we have the tra trash volume in the water that would justify? I, I mean, I can't. Alderman Payone, I'm not suggesting we need to buy trash skimmers. <laughs> that was a council amendment. Yeah. That was not anything the mayor put in his proposed budget. That was something the majority of the city council added back to the budget. There were questions about how effective trash skimmers are, um, et cetera. But it, it went nowhere because it was funded from the watershed fund and the city attorney gave an opinion, as you'll recall, that that is not an allowable use of the funds. So it was done in response to a request from the Annapolis Environmental Commission who have some requests regarding this, but uh, as you say, didn't happen. Um, a question I have about this is that land acquisition is struck and doesn't I don't think it appears again. If we want to do land acquisition, do we have the authorities to do it elsewhere in the code? 
If we were acquiring land for the purposes of supporting our compliance with NPDES, MS4, TMDL, local watershed TMDL, and stormwater watershed implementation plans, mm -hmm. if that was why we were buying the land, then we could use these funds for that okay. purpose. All right. Okay. So if we wanted to buy property where we were going to do some kind of stream or watershed restoration project, that would be allowed because that is an activity that supports our compliance with all of those requirements. So did I see there were <clears throat> people <clears throat> from Public Works here also to, I don't see anybody. Could, no, Director Gerald oh, couldn't, couldn't make it, it today. All right. So we do have three recommendations from the. Uh, Ashley is here for the water department. But Ashley, you're here for the. I'm here for whatever. Right. Okay. I think well. more for O26. Mm -hmm. But for this as well. 19, and the de definition of entity, or I don't know what, but. Um, so the uh, AEC um, has three recommendations that uh, they want the committee to consider. Um, provision should be added specifying that an annual report must be produced describing the amount of funds uh, raised and how the funds were spent. Um, is that not already part of our reporting, say, in the CAFR? Or something like that? Yes, the Watershed Restoration Fund revenues and expenses are indeed reported in the CAFR. I don't know if the Annapolis Environmental Commission, and I have advised them of that, if they haven't looked at that or if they don't think that is sufficient, if they're looking for a greater level of detail. I believe they're looking for the level of detail that you saw Alderman Arnett when the Environmental Matters Committee met Right. where the county has a 20-page glossy annual <laughs> report. Right. So if that's the level of detail they're looking for, provided Is, we get the resources to, to generate it, we'd be happy to do that. I'm not seeing anybody from the commission. Is there somebody here to speak to that? All right. So, um, I mean, we can at a later date, if we don't feel the CAFR provides enough information, they can come back and make an argument, I would presume. Does that satisfy the committee? Yeah. Uh, the second Mr. thing. Mr. Chair, we acted on some of these. If you look at, there's a, an attachment uh, also to the legislation, uh, Amendment 1 from July 17th. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's look at that. Um, amendment 1 doesn't seem to. Technical important. amendment. Yeah. There, yeah. yeah. But that, just saying that we went through these, and that's what we came up with as a change, And then I we believe. have Tierney Savage uh, requiring, oh yeah, so the, the amendment number two requires annual reporting on the fund. Mm -hmm. And amendment number three, annual report shall be submitted to the council that describes plan, plan current and Stop completed here. projects. Now, did, did we... I don't remember. Did we take these up and pass them? Well, it looks like uh, the amendment you're reading from is Savage, Tierney, and Arnett. Is that the Environmental Commission? I, that, I think that is the Environmental, environmental Matters. Matters. Yeah, Environmental yeah. Matters. So you all you have two amendments from Environmental Matters right. and one amendment from Finance. Didn't you all so, recommend amending it to leave the existing language in and add the new language just to make sure nothing got left out? I think that's what we're trying to figure yeah. out right now. That's what I, I, would I don't call. remember, but I think the appropriate body to consider these amendments is the Environmental Matters Committee. Well, they, those came from Environmental Matters. So, they have already are they asking us to affirm them? No. no. All right. <laughs> so it's just information. So when the uh, bill, the ordinance gets considered by the council, those amendments will be taken up. Um, going back to the uh, commission. Um, legislation s should state that it will be not used for routine maintenance of existing stormwater practices. Uh, I guess I would ask for a legal opinion, but in my view, uh, it doesn't have to say that explicitly. It says explicitly what it would be used for, but I'm certainly open to discussion from the committee. 
Under the proposed purposes, it would be allowed to be used for maintenance as so, long as, because maintaining our systems also helps us comply with all of our requirements. Um, but the Environmental Commission felt like um, the Stormwater Restoration Fund in their discussions should be used only for new projects and not for maintenance of existing watershed protection and restoration infrastructure. And the traditional, possibly apocryphal, story is that the fund was be, being used to repair stormwater basin, catchment basins and things like that. Um, I guess my sense is those are part of controlling TMDLs, so right? That's, that's correct. And if you use this fund to build new projects, and we are going to have to maintain the new projects as well. Mm -hmm. This has a history mm -hmm. when that was the only thing being done. The fund was very small, and that was the only thing being done. And I think it's carrying over. Um, I think the same with the number three about uh, the amount of administrative charges. But that is an accounting process we use right when we charge all of the different funds for administrative services provided by various staff that's correct but if you were to amend this bill if the if the environmental commission is asking you to amend this bill to not allow us to charge administrative charges to the fund and you were to pass that then we wouldn't mm -hmm. charge administrative costs to the fund but the administrative costs don't go away they would simply right. be borne by the general fund. Right. So that is a policy decision for the city council to make. Right. So I guess I'm asking for a sense of the committee. Does the finance committee have a desire to um, offer any amendments to accept any of these environmental matter commission items? Well, I have a, a question, and I'm looking at number three, which gives the parameters um, for administrative costs. Reasonable costs necessary to administer the local watershed protection and restoration fund. And reasonable can be anything. Would it benefit everyone to have specific percentages? For example, at least 50% of the fund, and I'm just using numbers now, uh, must be used for new projects. Uh, no more than 20% can be used for maintenance, uh, and whatever the other percentage that's left should be used for um, administrative or vice versa, or something like that. So that there are specific. But how would you do that and not be arbitrary? I don't think I'm qualified yeah. to know what those breakdowns would be. Well, clearly they want uh, all of the funding to be used for new projects. So that's a priority. So whatever the percentage is, I would think that would be the highest amount. Um, almost any project, no matter what it is, has a 20% administrative cost. That's not unique to anyone, I don't think. Um, what we hear often is we have all of these wonderful community groups who are doing all of these wonderful projects, but then we have to maintain them. So where do we get the funds to maintain them? You know, having a percentage of the stormwater fee would give us a dedicated amount to maintain existing projects. So I'm not, and basically, when those go in, the the entity doing it has a five-year responsibility. After that, it's taken up by the city. But um, I'm not. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. You're arguing the environmental stuff. I That's because it's a misnomer that I don't care about the environment. So don't, okay, don't fall for that crap. <laughs> All right. I guess, I mean, do you have a motion? I don't, I'm not prepared, and we don't have anybody here from the AEC to give us uh, guidance on what they think those ratios should be. And frankly, well, I we, would be well, loath to And I would say to you that you, the council, have the opportunity to weigh in on that every single yeah. budget. We present a budget right. to you. And it has a certain percentage of it's going to projects, and a certain percentage of it is going to admin. You get to weigh in on that. If you don't, if you don't want that much going to admin, cut that budget. Yeah. But, but as you point out, it still has to be paid for. Yeah, so, we still got to pay for it. Um, 
I kind of like keeping like things in the same bin so that we can see all of the expenditures that are going on, not have some And this is an news. enterprise fund, and in an enterprise fund, the goal is for it to be self-supporting mm -hmm. and covering all of its costs, not artificially taking some costs out and having them borne by the general fund. Mm -hmm. That is the purpose of an enterprise fund. Mm -hmm. Would it be feasible to have um, the department come back with recommendation? I mean, I don't know. Maybe it would be the same as what we our, have in our, front of us. Our, the city administration's recommendation would be the bill as proposed that would allow for both maintenance for projects, for the administrative costs that are related specifically to this, to mm -hmm. all be borne in this fund. I can tell you 51% of the monies do go to projects right now. And I forget the pe percentage that goes to other operating costs and the percentage that's uh, admin. I guess I'm, then you can give us those statistics. Mm -hmm. Clearly they exist. Mm -hmm. So I guess I'm not clear what the first recommendation is because it makes it sound as if there is no reporting as to how funds are spent. Right. And so, clearly there so is. It's, so clearly it's in the CAFR, but it may not be at the level of detail that they're seeking. And I have told them, simply tell me the level of detail you're seeking and we'll be happy to provide it. Okay. I don't know if they've asked for that in the past, with past administrations, and haven't been able to get that information. But I very specifically said at their meeting, yeah, tell me what you want and we'll get it for you. Uh, I guess there's an opportunity when this goes on the agenda for AEC to come and make a pitch. I also know that Environmental Matters is meeting later on this month and I'll be sure to revisit it. But uh, unless there's some specific amendment, I'm kind of inclined to agree with the city manager, the new language that allows us to do the things that we want to do with this fund. And um, not only that, there's an opportunity during the budget process to question the amounts of money being budgeted for various expenditures out of this fund. And in fact, the Environmental Matters Commission has come and testified at budget. And presumably, we all took that into account. So um, I'm certainly open to uh, a proposal for an amendment from the Finance Committee. But not hearing that, I would be open to a proposal that we recommend favorably to the council. Um, Mr. Chair, we do have an amendment from the Finance Committee. Right. So uh, does that need to be moved again? I thought or? we did that already. Yeah, yeah, we did. Okay. Yeah. So we would recommend favorably to the council from the Finance Committee with the one Finance Committee amendment. Uh, I'll make that motion Thank for you, you since you can't. <laughs> Second. All right. Is there any further discussion? Well, Mr. Chair, I think that uh, we are ready to go forward on this. I, I think that 20% is a reasonable number, that number that uh, my colleague from Ward 4 uh, mentioned. But as you said, we're not experts. And I also hesitate to uh, fill in the blank there for their third recommendation that way without right. some type of guidance. I, uh, uh, but, but I'm willing to, you know, pass it as is and we can deal with that perhaps yeah. at a time when we do have a little bit more information. All right. So um, we have a motion. It's been seconded. We've had discussion. Any further discussion? Telling that, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Okay. <coughs> so, uh, well, that <coughs> pretty much concludes the business of the Finance Committee. Is there a motion? <laughs> <laughs> all right. Next item on the agenda is 02619, which is continued discussion of the short term rental and license legislation. Um, I see a number of people in the audience. Uh, let me consult with the committee. First of all, uh, I've told you, but I will say on the record that I'm proposing an amendment to 
limit to get rid of the day limit so no 120 day limit and I think that speaks to a couple of the amendments that Alderman Gay has also proposed I'm also proposing an amendment to allow uh, outside ownership of the short-term rentals if there is a resident manager registered with the city that's still an open-ended question in that how many of these can you own I'm sympathetic to all of the testimony we've heard from largely uh, Naval Academy people who have owned a home here moved away kept the home are interested in using the home themselves for part of the year are interested in keeping the home for their children uh, my underlying notion of the uh, uh, amendment to allow one at least is that uh, these are people who know the community but having the resident manager is a person that is right here in the community so if there are problems uh, they uh, are uh, available for contact and can get right over to address the situation whether it's a broken hot water heater or whether it's staying out too late in the backyard and having conversations or whatever um, there are other remedies and this is a point that um, some some have made in emails and testimony I mean, if you have any noisy neighbor and they're making noise after 11 o'clock you have recourse to calling the police um, so I, I think that we can't forget that uh, uh, there are other kinds of remedies available and I would sort of resist getting into I'd like to as much as possible not differentiate types of rentals so going back to the 120 day limit we don't limit bed and breakfast to a certain number of days we don't limit hotels we don't limit long-term rentals so uh, it's not clear to me why we would want to limit uh, this particular kind of rental which I do think is product differentiated I think that a short-term vacation rental is different than a bed and breakfast uh, and and for um, positive reasons it's different so um, those are uh, amendments that I want to put forth we probably need to have some discussion of other amendments but I'm not particularly interested in hearing the same testimony over again for the umpty ump time um, I don't know what the mood of the committee is time is running short and we have other meetings today um, what is your sense on public hearing well I think if we could come up with the amendments that you just referenced mm -hmm. uh, we may speak to some of the concerns of those here willing to speak today um, I kind of agree that if folks have spoken to us once and provided us with testimony um, that's great um, it not better than great it was appreciated yeah. I think it has made a difference um, I I don't know what you think about um, further discussion on the number of if you don't live in the city but you own a number of properties how many of those can be in short-term rental uh, I did have a meeting uh, last week where that is a dis has been a discussion point I'm not I'm not in a place where I know where I want to go with that yet I don't know whether well, you've thought about it even or if you have what you've thought well mr. chair one thing we haven't addressed and it's been a, pointed out to us by a number of folks uh, since we started talking about this is what to do about the uh, people that live in uh, let's say Arnold or Edgewater who are very nearby and can be very responsive um, who may have more, more than one uh, property that would come within this um, this ambit it seems like it seems like they're different from uh, Academy grads who live in Dallas and and uh, you know rent their house out here on a short-term basis 
Um, I, I mean, I realize we can't be all things to all people, but right. um, I do think that perhaps we need to address that at some point. Um, and wh whether we make differentiate, you know, between them and the, the guy that lives in Dallas or Des Moines um, and the one that lives in Edgewater, I, I don't know. That remains to be seen, but I think it's an issue we haven't really discussed, and I think it's worth at least looking into. Right. Um, well, I think it is, although I've heard different mileage amounts. I've heard seven and a half miles, 10 miles, Well, I want somebody miles. that could be here within, you know, 15 or 20 minutes. Right, I, mean, I know that. they're but, that close. But the point is, who determines that? One of the things that we're doing in setting this up is uh, with inspections at a minimum, putting a huge administrative burden on the staff. Well, And if we have one more burden where, nope, you're seven and three quarters miles. Uh, so I guess to me, the really the more important issue is right now the legislation says if you are outside the city, right. you can't do this. Well, let's get that one settled. Uh, well, yeah, I'm not sure today's the day to discuss. I don't. I, I mean, I think we have a that, long way to go and a lot more yeah. fact finding to do. Okay. But uh, I take your point, and I, I agree that that is a standing issue and if you have an amendment that you want to put to the committee or when you have one I think we should take that up um, there are other pieces of information that I've been collecting and I'm sure you've been getting them too which is that uh, there are the there's uh, platforms that help manage this and some of the interesting bits of information that I have is that the interest of the platforms like VRBO uh, and the interest of us in protecting residents seem to be largely coincident. They're not interested in having bad bed and breakfasts either. And I find that encouraging because uh, um, we need all the help we can get. And having this be something that is smooth, uh, provides a product, a differentiated product, uh, and does not cause us a lot of trouble, and is also not, some of those troubles not remedied by a call to the police, or the public works, or to the plumber. Um, I think that's all well and good. Um, I've also heard discussion about um, when you live in the home, should you be inspected? Uh, I don't think we have a choice on that one. If, if you, I don't care how you're providing the service, whether you're living in it or investing in it, uh, and we know this from other realms, we need to inspect. State law says we need to inspect. Um, but again, I think that there's more input. So I guess what I would be interested in is some very brief statements, maybe a minute or two of new information, not repeating uh, testimony that's already been given. Um, then there's also a question that was raised by the city manager and it's why uh, Attorney Leonard is here about person versus entity and I've been getting all kinds of interesting phone calls on that and it gets into some constitutional questions which I haven't had the chance to sit down and talk with the Office of Law about, so I'm not prepared to, to bring it up today, but I think uh, it, it is an important issue. My goal is to have legislation that we can pass and stay out of court with. <laughs> and so those are uh, questions that we still have to have an opportunity to talk to the Office of Law. So what what is it's, the wisdom of the committee? Mr. Chair, when we began and throughout the entire process of uh, trying to come up with this legislation, um, we had community people involved from day one, but we also had our professional staff with us mm -hmm. who advised us. Um, Mr. Manassas is in the room now. Um, as well as Dr. Nash, the director. Um, I think that any discussion going forward that includes the amendments that you referenced, mm -hmm. we need to get staff's 
input. Right. Because whatever it is, it has to be doable for our staff. They're the ones who do the inspections and have to uphold the laws that we pass. Right. And so they help to guide us to where we are. They know that and have told us this is not the end all and the be all. Um, but I think the next step should include a discussion with the staff on what is doable in our amendments, the old ones that are already attached and any new ones that we come up with. Right. So um, let me just make another what I hope is um, calming statement. Uh, I know and have had conversations with the acting city attorney that we are planning on making uh, changes to this legislation as proposed that are so significant that uh, when we have a second hearing on this, uh, we will be advised and I am favorable to uh, when we come up for second reader, going back out for another public hearing mm -hmm. on whatever it is that we finally settle in on with a considerable amount of changes and refinements. And again, a thank you for all of the input that we've received. We have refined it in, in uh, response to comments that we've gotten and a lot of help that we've gotten from the uh, community at large. So um, again, uh, I'm looking for some guidance from the committee. Well, I, I'm interested in hearing new things that we haven't yet to consider, but. Mr. Chair, there appear to be a number of people. I know three have signed up, and I'm guessing that several others will want to speak today. If they came all the way down here to all right. speak to us, I think we certainly ought to hear them with the understanding that, you know, if you've already testified to some of these things, uh, I think it's obvious from our conversation that you've been heard. Um, but nevertheless, I, I think if I came all the way down here to address the committee that I would go home very unhappy okay. if I did not have that opportunity. So let's please, please, please keep it to new things and very short. The first one, name here is uh, Tricia Noon. Or no, no. All right. That's the one who sent the email. She sent us an email. Well, I don't have it though. I'm sorry. It's okay for me to come up and sit down. Of course. If you know how to use the microphone. <laughs> you'd be surprised you'd be surprised how many people can't. Wow. Let me know if I'm doing okay. I can always use guidance. Is the green light on? It is. Okay. It is. So um Oh, thank you. <laughs> See, I, I seriously I'm like everybody else, I need help. I really do. Gotcha. Um, finance members, I really appreciate you taking the time to include your community members in the development of the legislation. I'm Trisha Moore. I'm the um, founder and executive director for Citizens for STR. We're a growing group of members that's focused on fair regulation regarding short-term rentals. I represent about 800 members in the D.C. area, including members here that are in this room in Annapolis, but also members that are not here. We are watched literally by thousands across the country. And I just want to let you know that we support Annapolis in developing fair legislation for everyone in your community. Um, in Annapolis specifically, boarding rooms and rentals go back for centuries. This is nothing new, as well as the tourism. Annapolis's small business community thrives on the tourist dollars that come in. And the change that's happened within the last decade or so is that the internet platforms have just made it easier for guests and hosts to find each other. We really support fair regulation utilizing your existing codes and laws. So earlier today, I emailed um, Takia uh, copies of a report specifically from Alexandria City on short-term rentals. This information specifically discusses how short-term rentals are going fine in Alexandria City. And I think the, there's a good correlation between the city of Annapolis, which I've personally spent a lot of time in myself, 
um, as well as Alexandria City. Both have many antique properties, both have a big thriving tourist community, both have a main street with a lot of small businesses, and both are wonderful, wonderful communities. So in Alexandria City's case, they do not require an inspection for entering the sharing community. What they do require is that people register their properties, but that's it, because it's been going on in Alexandria much like it has here. The one thing that I would say that Alexandria City has done very successfully is they've partnered with the platforms to actually collect the tax. And I know in the state of Virginia it really is a nightmare, and I could go into it in a lot of detail, but I won't waste your time. People do come and go off these platforms. They go into this and try and want to do this and then decide that it's not really a match for them. Great hosts and great owners will stay on the platforms, and bad hosts will go. They are self-reporting, so if you get bad reviews, nobody's going to come and stay at your property. So it's really critical to recognize that the people that own these properties, they take this money and invest back in their properties, and they take care, take care of the character in your community. Keeping properties painted and upkeep is great, and landscaping is done because they want them to look a certain way. I would ask you to um, keep in mind that the platforms have done very well as far as tax collection. And additionally, I also emailed a copy of an article that was put out with regard to the city of Alexandria. They blew away their tax collection numbers. So it has far surpassed their expectations by partnering with the platforms. It just makes it easier for people to come, come on and off. I would also ask you to reconsider the inspections of the residential properties. You know, Alexandria is, is not doing any inspections. You can see the results in the report that I sent you. There are very few complaints. I think some of the things will be similar. There are parking complaints that come in, but there are very few. Um, the one thing that I would say is that no host, owner, property owner ever wants anybody to have a problem in their property. So most people are concerned with what's going on in Maryland law. If you have major concerns in the properties, I would mandate in your application that people make sure that their smoke detectors are up to date and that they have CO2 detectors if necessary. Work based on the complaints coming in rather than hiring additional staff. It will save you a fortune. Watch how it goes over the next couple of years and then go from there. I will say also Fairfax County, many of our members in Fairfax County have a lawsuit against Fairfax County because of far reaching over regulation. There are many cases within the ordinance of Fairfax County that break federal and state laws. Um, they completely blocked second residences from coming in and that is a big issue for many people that own multiple properties. On a positive note, I will say Fairfax County recently changed their zoning to specifically say that unwarranted inspections are recognized as being unlawful in Fairfax and in the Commonwealth of Virginia. And the Fourth Amendment right in the Constitution basically says that homeowners, their, their rights had been violated um, to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures. So there is some constitutional law that really backs this up. I will say we are a very large growing organization. We support anybody's rights to rent their properties while, very importantly, respecting local codes and laws for their city and states. Our organization was responsible for a statewide bill that was written in the Commonwealth of Virginia. It passed through the Senate 20, 26 to 12 with bipartisan support. I would sincerely be happy to sit down with any of the members of the committee and talk to you further over a cup of tea or a glass of wine so that we can work out any issues that you have. And I sincerely mean that because I just don't want anybody not to be able to rent their property. And I'm happy to answer any questions you might have for me. Did you bring wine with you? I don't, but I will. <laughs> I have been invited out afterwards, so you can come with us. I would love it. I would love for you to join us, really, sincerely. Oh, um, a couple of things. What, what makes you think that uh, Airbnb owners would be uh, would voluntarily comply in effect with uh, well do self inspections is what what you're suggesting um, well the the reality is is that we want our homes to be great for our guests and I sincerely mean that so 
we want to make sure people are going to be safe. I would never want somebody to have a problem in one of my properties. So I put fire extinguishers in my properties and I point them out to people. I send a welcome information that tells people where to go and which businesses to visit. I make sure that I am up to date on my um, smoke detectors and my CO2 alarms. I do, I do that stuff because I think it's important. I take care of my guests. That's what I want to do. Why is inspection a problem? Yeah, I don't, I don't understand why. what's the big deal about an inspection. Well, it's not so much <clears throat> having somebody come out and do an inspection. It's really the overall cost that goes along with it mm. and the time that it takes and the time that it takes away from being able to actually rent your property. So you answer a lot of these questions as you go through things and you provide and put pictures up online of your property. So if there's any questions people have, I'm more than happy to answer them at any particular time. But these houses are better maintained than a long-term rental. And most of the complaints show that. You know, when you actually get down into the actual statistics, um, in Fairfax County, which is much bigger than Annapolis, it's over 1.25 million people. In a two-year time period, there were less than 200 complaints. Uh, the vast majority of them are, there's a short-term rental here. They were not legitimate complaints. In comparison, there were nine to 10,000 complaints that the city inspectors had to deal with. So when you think about staff and then you add on, you have how many homes that you wanna have inspected, how much staff do you have, how much do they cost? How much are their benefits? How long are you gonna keep them on? There's a, there's a significant expense to it. So if you want people to do things right, just tell them what right is and they'll do it. Okay, thank you. Well, but still, I'm, Having a hard time with the logical consistency, you're saying that uh, the homes are up to code, and that's fine, and I hope they are, but then you're saying if they're inspected, there's a big cost to the homeowners. What can that cost be unless it's repairing things to bring things up to code? Well, it depends on the it depends on the particular location. My experience in the state of Maryland is that there for long term rentals, there is one in the county. You have to pay in the county, you have to pay one in the town that you're in, and the homeowner actually has to pay for that. And then additionally to that, there's lead inspection paints, uh, lead inspection reports that have to be well, done. We're talking as well. about one or two hundred dollars. I mean Maybe in the city of Annapolis it is, but if it ends up going at a statewide level, it's two seventy-five um, for an overall right. county, okay. two seventy-five so, for another city, and then four hundred dollars for a lead inspection. That's about a thousand dollars. That's a big but, expense. But I've had I've had people say that this will cost ten thousand, maybe more dollars, and I, you know, that sounds to me like you're making repairs to bring your property up to code. And uh, yes, and I would agree with that. If somebody's talking ten thousand dollars, I absolutely yeah. agree with you. That's uh, that's a hundred dollars is a cost of doing business, and you have to remember this is now a business. This is not a residence anymore. It's a business, and that is a normal cost of doing business. It's the same cost that long-term rentals pay. It's the same cost that hotels pay. It's the same cost that bed and breakfast pay. So, I I, I guess it's just not clicking with me why this is onerous unless in fact the house is not up to code i really think that when you're looking at homes that are in um, the annapolis area you're going to have a very wide range mm -hmm. of houses that range from you know recently built to hundreds of years ago and of course the code is going to be different so i'm just going to give you an example in my particular case i have a um I have an 1897 historic Victorian. It's a Queen Anne Victorian with balloon frame, con balloon frame construction. So because it was built in 1897 at the time, there weren't the, the Boca codes that there are in place today. So there would not be fire stops on the framing in that particular property. If it was inspected, would you mandate that those fire stops got put in place? And that would mean in that particular case, and I'm just giving this one particular example, so you have to um, remove drywall, put in the fire stops, have it inspected, put back in drywall, repaint, and reinspect. That could be a ten thousand dollar cost depending on the size of the mm -hmm. property. So, are we talking about that? Or are we talking about keeping people safe? I I don't know what 
the writers are talking about. I just know the amounts of money they're talking. But mm -hmm. we obviously do have old homes. My home is 100 years old. Uh -huh. uh, and it wouldn't meet current codes, but it does. it is grandfathered in. So should I want to get into this business, which I don't, uh, <laughs> I would be grandfathered for those kinds of things like fire stops. Uh, and I think that's been the treatment all along. That's the same treatment for bed and breakfast, some of which are over 100 years old. Mm -hmm. um, so again, I mean, we're, we want to we hear this, and I think that Alderman Payone's questions are on topic, but mm -hmm. I, I guess my gut tells me if you don't want to be inspected, that might have a reasonable possibility that that's because you won't pass inspection. Mm -hmm. And that's the very homes that we want to inspect because one of our primary jobs is life safety. Mm -hmm. That is a responsibility of the elected officials. And, well, we're, uh, we're, I'm in complete agreement with you. Yeah. We want people to be safe. There's no question about okay. that. Well, that, your two minutes are up. Okay, then. <laughs> so what time are you going to be joining me for wine? Well, where? <laughs> yeah, well, I don't think, given the audience, we'll be doing anything before dinner time. Oh. Let's well, see. So yeah, we do. Yeah, thank so you we for will. coming down. Uh, Julian... Julian Donnelly. Julian. 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 Oh, thank you. Julian Donnelly, 16215 George Street. I promise I'm talking about some things right here today. A um, couple things that I just wanted to bring up was remittance of taxes. Uh, depending on how you guys want to do this, I currently own a property in Sedosia, West Virginia, and they really uh, started implementing tax collection on private property owners. 17, 18. Could you turn mic, your mic microphone? On? Push the thing that says push. Now the green light's on. Um, in Pocahontas County, Snowshoe, essentially, in 2017 18, that's when we really had to um, submit our property taxes there. And so what they do is every month we have to submit our tax collection. It would be great if the platforms would do it for us. Currently, in the state of West Virginia, they do not. Um, so if you were looking at tax collection on this, I would ask that you look at doing it quarterly rather than monthly, because it is pretty much a burden on the homeowner to have to do it monthly. But if you did it quarterly, it's a, a bit more manageable. Um, I also have printed out kind of their tax code and, and how they're implementing it, as well as um, the system, a printout of what they do, the information they collect and how we submit it every month. They do charge a 2%, 2.2% fee when paying by credit card and then there's also a late fee that is implemented if done after the 15th of the month so that can be burdensome if, if i forget and it's the 16th i just i have to pay an extra 15 dollars plus it's a five percent penalty so quarterly i think would kind of be the way to do it i'm kind of tagging on to some of the things that had just come up that patricia moore brought up um, on inspections people are afraid i am inspected um, it is two different costs. Short-term rentals are $200 a year. Long-term rentals are $100 a year. So there is a, a difference that we do. The inspection is exactly the same. Mm -hmm. So I'm not quite sure why we have a cost difference on that. If, we ever, if we ever get to it, that legislation, those resolutions are up next, and we will address that. Okay. Um, people are afraid to do it because of some of the things that we are asked to do. So, for example, last, and I've been inspected for the last 15 years, Last year, I was asked, I had a different inspector, um, I was asked to put a hardwired smoke detector in my kitchen. To get it there and to tack into the existing system, it cost me nearly $500 to do that. The electrical inspector came to inspect the work, and he said, why the heck did you put a smoke detector in the kitchen? And I explained why. It's because <laughs> the city inspect. So uh, the inspectors across the board aren't even on the same page. So I know people who you know, went through five and six months of delays because every time a different inspector came out, they said, you have to do this, you have to do that. Yes, that's the last thing you have to do. And then there'd be another page. And that's what people are fearful of here. Right. Um, that's kind of where that comes in. And also- Let me, Can I stop you for just sure. a second though? Because um, another avenue that I've been thinking about and uh, we need to discuss as a council, some of the things that we need to look at and I, Glad that John Manessa is sticking his head around the corner. Apparently, one person has 
a worry that they're not going to be uh, approved with inspection because their washer dryer is in the basement. Well, you know what? Mine is too, and a lot of people are. And I guess what we want to do is go up back and look at other parts of the code to make sure that the things we're inspecting are really what we need to be inspecting, which will change it for everybody, not just the short-term rental. So when you're sending us emails, getting a collection of those kinds of things is very helpful. That's a different kind of discussion with John and the, the planning and zoning inspection staff. And one thing, when you um, somebody said that they were grandfathered in, you're not grandfathered in. Unless you are currently licensed, you are not grandfathered in. It's up to current code. I have a house built in 1904, and it didn't matter. On that. <laughs> There's no grandfathering. But we just ask that it be consistent across the board. So if you're only renting out for commissioning, boat show, whatever, everybody should be taxed the same, whether I'm doing it year-round or for special events. Um, that's kind of my thought anyway. It's, uh, people may not agree with me, but I don't think we can pick and choose who's going to be taxed on it. If we're generating income from a short-term rental, whether it be for 10 days, or for 100 days, it needs to be the same across the board. So okay. I did print these out. I don't know if you all want them, but it's basically another, um, you know, a, a, a tourist area and how they're doing things. That would be helpful, but also electronic would be great, too. Okay. I will scan them in and email them. Thank you. All right. Who do we have? Is it? Oh, it's Bruce Brariano. Although it really looks like Ann Lamb. <laughs> Good afternoon, uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the Finance Committee. I'll be very brief with new information. For the record, uh, Bruce Berriano, registered lobbyist for Expedia. Um, I uh, thank uh, uh, Chairman Arnett and uh, uh, Alderman Payone. I know uh, my client and I have met with both of you. We've had very fruitful conversations. I know I'm meeting with um, uh, Council with uh, Alderman Finlayson soon as well. Uh, I sent to all three of you and your colleagues um, two documents in the mail. I didn't want to email them. Uh, you, hopefully you've gotten them or you'll get them shortly. Um, What's mail? Mail is uh, something that the United States Post Office, <laughs> which I love, and which is historical and part of America, uh, they go around and drop things off at people's homes and businesses. Uh, I said two documents. One is um, a copy of the Louisville statute, which I had conversations. I wanted to follow up just, just to look at it as a model. Uh, it's one that was adopted in the city of Louisville, Kentucky, which uh, Expedia was very involved in, which uh, I think hopefully will, will be some good ideas for you, and uh, we are very comfortable with the only provision of that that I pointed out in my uh, remarks and what I mailed to you is that there was a provision in there which we did not like at all, which we thought would be very inappropriate uh, in Annapolis, and that is a location. You couldn't have a, you couldn't have a short-term rental um, closer than a certain number of feet from another one, and I, I don't see any logic to that, but that piece we do, we do, do not. And the other piece that we took the time, again, just to be helpful, was we drafted up a statute uh, 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 separate from the Louisville one, embodying some of that, but else, again, just to give you some ideas and thoughts in a comprehensive way, not trying to take your prerogatives away or your thoughts. Mm -hmm. uh, the amendments you, you think of, Mr. Chairman, were, as right. we had in conversation, we're very comfortable with and really like. Um, it, it's logical and what have you. And uh, uh, some of the, the, the larger, more emotional issues are issues you get, whether you have short-term rentals or not. And no one wants them, and they need to be dealt with in terms of noise, trash, parking, stuff like that. Whether you're long-term rental, short-term rental, none of that should be tolerated or, or, uh, or, or what have you. So that is new information. Please look that over. Okay. We're going to have further meetings um, at your, at your, at your uh, convenience. Uh, and uh, my client, as we've said, want, wants to work very closely with you in really producing something that's uh, appropriate for Annapolis, reflective of Annapolis. and. Uh, really makes uh, business sense. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for your help. Um, before we go on to the next, that that is something, committee, that we've heard off and on. Um, we've heard, you know, the number of these units on Fleet Street and Cornhill Street and so forth. I don't know where we are in our thinking for bed and breakfast. They're limited to one per block face. Uh, I 
Well, yeah. If, well, right now you're, but that's that's different owners. So you can have on Fleet Street seven different owners of an Airbnb, and they could be residents of the city, and they're legal under this code. So the the concern here, and one of the underlying concerns that promulgated this legislation was that whole communities would be changed from residential with homeowners living in the homes to short-term rentals with investors owning the home. And um, I haven't done any further refinement. To be honest, other than a couple of locations in the city, this hasn't really been reported to be a big problem. And I think one of the things that I've been thinking about is let's get some basic legislation in place because we really don't know what we're dealing with. We don't know. It's one of the questions I asked uh, Mr. Bariano's client is how many Airbnbs are there in the city in your platform? It could be 150. It could be 3,000. We don't really know. Um, and so I guess my sense is let's be gradual, get get our nose under the tent flap, and then if there is an area that has a huge concentration, as apparently Lexington seemed to think they have, then we can think about what the remedies are for that um, and, and whether we even have the uh, legal authority to do a remedy for that. So anyway, um, there are other people here. I assume other people want to speak, so uh, bring yourselves forward as you need, and please, um, no repeats, <laughs> and uh, give us your name and address when you start, please. Mr. Chair, we have another meeting at 1 o'clock. Yes, Do I know, so we have, So I and I it happens to, to be on Airbnb, I mean, bed and <laughs> breakfast. Yes. Uh, so. Um, so could we ask our speakers to kind of limit their comments to two minutes so we can hear from everybody? I Thank doubt we're you. going to hear from everybody today, well, but we have another finance meeting in two weeks, and this will be on the agenda again. Uh, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to speak today. I really appreciate it, especially given the time shortage. I'm Susan Margulies. I'm a professor at the Naval Academy, and I've come to speak to you today about two particular things. The first is on page 3, line 18 of the ordinance, where you define a short-term rental as any agreement written or oral. Any agreement written or oral for lodging. Wh which line number, please? I'm on page three. I'm looking at the first reader, line 18. 13. Line 18 of page three, where you define a short-term rental to be any agreement written or oral. So um, I own a home, uh, 113 Conduit Street. I'm a stone's throw from here, and I have a spare guest room. And on many occasions, as I'm sure have you, um, I've had friends in need. When my friends, the storm came through in Kent Island, and all the windows went out of my friend's house. My friend's house was terribly damaged. Them, a husband, a wife, a little girl with special needs, a very old dog, they all came instantly to my house to stay. And they had to stay with me for a good two and a half months. And of course we had an agreement, oral, that they would chip in a little and they would help contribute for the household. And under this ordinance, I would have to get a license and a home inspection to help out that friend, and I would be subject to a $200 a day fine if I did not follow that law. So the first thing I would ask is that that one line, the definition of a short-term rental, be changed to not an agreement written or oral, but why not make it consistent with many of the other Airbnb legislations all across the U.S., which says a short-term rental is something that's offered to the public on an internet-based uh, website that charges a booking fee. And with that small change that's consistent with the legislation in New York, San Francisco, Boston, all of these other different municipalities, you could fix this problem of having to have a license to help a friend in need. Um, 
Uh, I have one other very quick point, and if it is okay, may I approach and hand you something? Sure. Is that all right? Of course. Um, so we have a specific for how to deal with the no home inspections for owner-occupied Airbnbs. And I'm jogging back to the microphone very, very quickly. Um, so, Alderman Payon, you very pertinently asked, how do you know that someone who is using a spare guest room in their home, I'm only asking for no home inspections for owner-occupied homes. No one in our community, as you've seen, objects to home inspections for second homes. I'm only asking to consider waiving home inspections for homes where people are full-time residents. I'm always there, unless I'm working one of my 18-hour days, then I'm not there. But uh, so the model that I have shown you is the New Orleans application for a short-term rental license. And if you look, you check boxes, you attest, I have smoke detectors, check. On my honor, I am submitting this to the city, I am signing this, it's a formal document. I attest, I have CO detectors, I attest, check. I have notified my neighbors. You have these four or five, check, I have liability insurance. How can you guarantee that a host will do these things on your honor? You are attesting to these things. And these attestations are folded into the Airbnb listing in places like San Francisco. Airbnb has worked very closely with San Francisco uh, to make their attestation process part of their listing. This is also done in Boston. Uh, so, and it's also done in Baltimore. In Baltimore, they have inspections for second homes, but registration only for owner-occupied homes. So I would ask you to just mull over, mull this over. And the second thing I've handed you is the apartment checklist, 14 sections and 105 sub-items that John Manassa, who's amazing, um, very kindly sent to me. Uh, so on one hand, you have that from Annapolis, that is what you have to do. And on the other hand, you have this nice, simple application from New Orleans. So because of time, um, I'll stop there. But I would really relish the opportunity to chat with you further about just these two issues. OK, thank you. Other questions, observations from the committee? All right. I guess my, uh, I hearken back to, uh, I guess it was a president, trust but verify. <laughs> Um, but we have certain state laws and city codes and unless we're going to change those um, I don't I don't personally see the ability to differentiate it's what? it's a business and once you enter into a business kind of arena you've made a choice and I think that choice comes with responsibilities but we have this we will consider it I have seen and actually responded to some of your emails, I understand your point. I just, I'm not there personally, but that's only one of nine votes. Thank you very much. All right. Um, let's see. Uh, okay, just one second. Um, we probably, first of all, we have other things on the agenda. Um, the fees and another uh, item that has to do with a fee I'm mindful that we're holding the finance director here, who you, I'm sure you're enjoying all of the short-term rental, but but I, I would ask the committee, I think we're going to have to, and I guess I'd ask Takia, uh, is there time sensitivity on the um, the last resolution on the fee for critical area? Is there any time sensitivity if we'd, we take it up two weeks from now? I don't know. I don't know the answer okay. to that question. Well, I'm. I, I I'm going to assume that there's not a time sensitivity, and say that we'll finish at 12:30 with listening to testimony. We will, this will be on the agenda again in two weeks. So we're and we're not stopping listening. We're also we've told you we're not going to rush this through. We're going to listen 
and even after we make changes which will be significant there will be more opportunities for a public hearing on this so um, um, you'll have to trust us that we're we're going to keep our word but we're not going to rush this we know it's important to you and it's important to us so um, I would ask the committee sense of we postpone the remaining pieces of legislation till the next finance committee meeting which would relieve Jody and or the city manager and um, I would ask the same thing of the committee there are legal questions I've heard raised today and there are legal issues that were raised at the last meeting that I think we need to have some time with uh, attorney Leonard uh, to talk about but uh, unless she wants to stay I'm not sure we need to hold her here either mr. chair I would move that the remaining um, legislation be continued for two weeks the, rem the remaining hearing or the, oh, the remaining, remaining legislation yes, on the agenda you. thank you yes, um, mr. mr. chair I do have another issue that is pressing okay that I would like to bring to uh, the committee okay so I don't know whether you want to wait. Are you are we well, cutting we, off all speakers right now? Or? Mm, no. Well, I don't know because I need to. Yeah. Okay. I, I want maybe hear a couple more, but um, then I will. Will you second his because that's just to postpone the legislation? Yes, I'll second. Any, it. All right. Uh, yeah. All those in favor of postpone. Before you vote, I wanted to mention that at the next finance committee meeting, I believe you'll be talking about the bond ordinance. Okay. and the other legislation that we've submitted to um, transfer some of the bond proceeds for you okay. so it'll be more things on the agenda I just want okay. to remind you um, we understand that so um, all those in favor of postponing the remainder of the legislative agenda as proposed by Alderman Payone indicate by saying aye aye, aye. the ayes have it all right um, how long do you think you need for your um, I don't know five minutes I, I'm gonna ask uh, mr. Uh, Manassas and dr. Okay. Nash to join us so right. are we going straight let's to have that two more okay. people speak and uh, then we'll reschedule further testimony I saw Chris Buchheiser and um, I'm sorry I've forgotten your name already after we just met Monique yes uh, let's hear those two and then um, We'll continue having a public hearing at the next finance committee meeting. All right, get your stopwatch. I'm talking less than a minute. <laughs> Alderman Arnett, Mr. Chair, appreciate the uh, opportunity. Um, as you all know, uh, the meeting with the Ward 1 residents last uh, week was um, designed because Ellie Tierney, our alderwoman, uh, has recused herself from this discussion. It's very important to the historic district and Ward 1. and. Um, our guest speaker was Alderman Arnett, and he, he pulled out of the discussion because he said it's not ready for prime time. I agree. I think we ought to take some time to get this thing right. I think there are a lot of really good people involved, and I think just, um, I don't think there's a time limit on the legislation, is there? No. Is there? No. Then let's, let's just get it right. That's all I yep. got to say. Yep. Great. And I'm I 5 agree. Wagner Street. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Pretty close. All right, Monique. Hi, I'm Monique Lightheart, and I just wanted to say thank you very much for all your considerations. I'm looking for a win-win solution. Um, I think it's it's great the process that's being made. You know, um, I appreciate all the consider consideration of the neighbors and uh, other businesses and. Um, uh, I would just like to say maybe if we can di differentiate between new licenses instead of just old licenses and have some grandfathering in because if we're going to tax everybody and I'm all in favor for taxing and regulations and licenses if we're going to tax just like um, bed and breakfast and just like hotels then we should also treat um, Airbnbs more like bed and breakfast and hotels and not limit how many businesses people have because since when is it being a landlord or an invest investor since when is that a dirty word you know people this is America and it's free enterprise it should be free enterprise and um, so yeah you should get all the tax revenue um, and let people uh, run their business but run it responsibly 
and I, and I, I'm looking for a win-win for neighbors, neighborhoods, and, and businesses alike. And thank you again very much. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right. Um, is there somebody who desperately needs to speak today and would not be able to come back for our next public session? We'll, uh, since those last two were so short, we can entertain one more, but then we do have to stop. Seen no motion in the chamber. Um, Alderwoman Finlayson, you had an issue to raise. Um, uh, before you go on, can you continue? With pardon me? Make a motion to continue. Uh, yeah, we need a motion to continue the public hearing. Uh, Mr. Uh, no Chair, I'll motion to continue the move that we continue 02619, continue the public hearing on 02619. Thank Second. You. All in favor? All right. All right. Okay. Okay. Well, so, write that down. Um, Mr. Chair, I wanted to um, ask the question about the HACA inspections. Um, okay. We've seen lots of discussions publicly about where we are, and um, I think we are on track to get all of the public housing, or at least there's a request to get all of the public housing units inspected by the end of the year. So my question for both Dr. Nash and Mr. Manassas, um, if you guys could come up. Um, is to whether you have the adequate resources to get this task done. Now's your chance, Dr. Nash. Good morning, Sally Nash, Department of Planning and Zoning. John Manassa, Chief of Code Enforcement, Planning and Zoning. <laughs> Guess you know her. Um, we've started our inspections of Robinwood. We did 70 inspections so far. Um, we're we're um, pacing ourselves, um, planning to do 70 a month um, because of our resources. We have hired a new property maintenance inspector, um, but sh and she'll be starting um, in the next week or so. Um, but still, we'll need some training, and you know, so it'll take a while until she's fully up to speed. Uh, this we're is still the one that was just funded in the recent budget, yes, the new position. That's right. Okay. Um, so we're we're still wrestling with how we're going to handle the um, reinspections. Um, without overwhelming our our four inspectors, um, but we're, we're we're we met with the city manager yesterday to figure out a game plan of how we can do that in a way um, that doesn't completely overwhelm our system. So at the rate we're going, uh, if we're doing 70 inspections, uh, we're going to get 280 of the units inspected by year's end. Or, by cap. or oh. let me put it another way, it would take us 10, 11 months to get all of them inspected at the That's right. We, we planned for a calendar year to get it done. I, I'm sorry, fiscal year to get it done. That's mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. And these are new units, not the ones that were inspected before? It's everything. It's, it's okay. But the ones you're focusing on now, are you reinspecting some of the ones that have been inspected we prioritized the ones what we believed had um, the largest number of life safety issues smart so does that mean Newtown 20 is you just said Robin Wood and yep Newtown 20 would be next um, however we don't have an um, application yet for that property from the Housing Authority Okay, do you have applications for all the other properties? No, just Robinwood. So is that a hold up? That you don't have the applications yet? Um, well, we haven't completed the 70 we have scheduled for September, but we would need the applications soon to begin scheduling for October. So what would it take for you to get these inspections done by the end of the year? And by I'm talking about staff. Just um, December? Yeah. Year? Um, I, I don't think that we could do that. We, we just don't have, we'd have to have twice as many inspectors. And did you say you have four inspectors? We have four now. We've just hired the fourth one. Yeah, so a fifth on. 
And I mean, honestly, it would be hard for the housing authority to keep up with us and make the repairs as well. You know, we're trying to be flexible and make sure they have time to address the concerns, some of which are pretty minor, you know, a loose doorknob here, um, you know, a missing handle here, but, um, you know, some of them will take a little bit more time to get people into just because of the number of units that need some little thing um, to be addressed. How many units do you think are going to totally fail? What is it the HUD calls it? The the thing where you have to get a score of at least 60? The REACT? Yeah, the REACT. How many do you think will... T I, I'm worried about displacing people and oh, they're well, not no one will be, you know, no one will be evicted um, based on a, a failed inspection. Um, we're going to work with them and, and, you know, make sure no one is displaced. So even if there's mold or sewerage? Well, if the unit is uninhabitable, right. then yes, we would work with HACA. But I don't, I don't <laughs> believe any of the units are, are that bad right now. Okay. Except Newtown 20. All right. Oh, so, I mean, obviously the council voted to do these inspections, um, but I've always worried that we may have unintended consequences. But it sounds to me like there, if there are people who are whose units are not habitable, it's not going to be a huge number, and um, there should be ability to relocate them elsewhere in the housing authority. Is That's that my yourself? understanding. Oh, that's good to hear. Thank you. Well, in an aside, um, in a recent meeting I had with Mrs. Wilborn, um, she indicated that they are working on units so they have some place to move folks, mm -hmm. um, not just from Newtown 20, but um, you know through the inspections if they have to displace people. Okay. Um, so they're they're working on that piece of it. Um, at the same time trying to, I guess, address um, the infractions that you all are finding. Um, Robin Wood is not on the, I guess, urgent list. At least, I don't think it is, and I could be wrong. Uh, I thought it was Newtown and then Morris Blum. Um, what types of, did you find major issues there? Um, that would slow up your inspections or I don't think there's anything we weren't really anticipating um, things actually are a little bit improved from when we were there in 2016 overall um, you know I think it it will be a question of of how HACA is going to pay for um, all of the improvements they need to make that aren't necessarily life safety but are more in the um, mm -hmm. cosmetic and maintenance type categories. If you had to put a dollar value on um, the work that needs to be done in Robinwood, could you do that? Mm -hmm. I I could not do that. Yeah, I, I don't think we quite have enough. Um, we haven't really compiled the data in a way that we'd be able to do that analysis At as all. of yet. As of yet. I mean, right, we, we really just finished the first 70 last week. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, we're just really glancing at the data now to see what's, what the major issues are. I guess I'm trying to figure out where to go for that information. If I, if I asked for a dollar amount oh. that it would take to bring Robin Wood to where we need it to be, would you oh. have that number or would the Housing Authority oh. um, have um, that number? Well, in a, in a few weeks, once we finish the next 70, we can probably try to do a tally uh, of the repairs and at least give you a um, ballpark figure for what we would estimate. Is that right, John? Do you want to add something? Yeah, we're generally not in the business of being cost estimators. So I, that, that's a little beyond our scope. Housing Authority would probably have a much better um, resource for the 
their experience on cost and, and everything to make repairs. In their labor. Their labor, too. Would, I mean, it would be a lot of their labor, so we wouldn't really be able to estimate that cost. Mm -hmm. Okay. So to summarize, at 70 a month, it'll take eight months to do this. Obviously, eight months is beyond the end of the year. And there's no other feasible way to increase the number of inspections. Am I correct in assuming that with the staff we have? Right. We would have to prioritize these inspections over other inspections, which we wouldn't necessarily want to do because we'd still need to do those eventually. Yeah. Um, I think it's better to figure out how to incorporate these additional 800 units into our program from here on yeah. out no, um, because that's what we will need to do. So. Right. So 70 months, eight months for... 792 units. So we're talking mm -hmm. about um, before the end of the middle of next year, calendar year. And I'm counting that as 10 months, 792 well, units. 70 into <coughs> 792. Oh, yeah, right, 10 months. That's the English yeah. teacher, too. Yeah, I know. Proud of that. me, yeah. 11 months. All right. <laughs> okay. Well, um, that, one more question. Sure. They're not paying for their inspections, correct? Did we waive those fees? We didn't waive the fees. The council approved an $80,000 community grant to HACA for HACA to pay the fees. So we have given them a grant with a restricted purpose. Okay. Um, at one point, and I, this is in the previous administration, did we not waive the fees? I know we did because I sponsored that. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously that died with whatever budget we were in. Um, but you're, you're right. Um, I thought that that resolution or ordinance didn't pass and that the previous city attorney had raised questions on the constitutionality of it or something. This was think during the Panelides administration. I don't think it passed. Yeah. My memory ends with the end of each administration. Yeah. I think it did pass. Yeah. Okay. I we'll look we that up. I, fees, I've been on it. We'll look that up. The, but we have it funded now. Yes, it's funded so. now. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm sorry. Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, is, there, is there a second? A second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 The ayes have it. Okay. Um, I don't think they heard <coughs> This is a uh, draft. Yeah, we've got another meeting with the hotels now. I don't. I don't think the community heard that the meetings adjourned. Oh, yeah, we're yeah, that was because Takia didn't hear it right here. Okay. 